Good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Melinda and the CETA team for this opportunity to chair this morning's session, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, can I begin by um, adding my respects to the traditional custodians of the lands where we meet today, um, including the elders past, uh, present and emerging. Um, in introducing Romilly uh, today, I'd like to highlight the very important uh, role that in Infrastructure Australia plays in, in, in our, uh, not just the construction sector, but to society generally. Um, they're, uh, they're a source of truth in terms of policy and research uh, around what the, the Australian uh, nation needs for infrastructure to um, improve its society and, and move forward a, as a people. Um, I guess, for, for me, Infrastructure Australia fills a, a void that perhaps um, uh, is sometimes needed when you see the partisan nature of some um, politics. Uh, you can always rely on Infrastructure Australia to be providing um, a, a very impartial assessment of what our needs for uh, infrastructure are. Um, the, I, I guess there's two aspects of um, Romley's um, discussion today that I'm interested in. Recently there was a, an audit um, re released by Infrastructure Australia which was an update from uh, a previous audit four or five years ago and there's, um, there's some interesting aspects of that that I'm, I'm sure Romley will touch on today. And the other aspect of, uh, of the, the talk today that is of interest to me is the, uh, the concern that the industry um, is stretched for resources and uh, all governments around Australia are seeking to, to invest more in infrastructure. And I think, um, as we heard yesterday, um, the word collaboration is, um, is going to be very important in the future to work together, uh, both pu public and private sectors, to ensure that the the, the needs of infrastructure around our nation are met. So with those few words, uh, please please join me in welcoming Romney to the stage. Thanks, Jim. I don't know if I should steal this seat of pen. It's quite cool, so I might. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks very much for having me here. And um, I, too, acknowledge that we're on Ngunnawal land. Uh, I was privileged to live and work in this region for a number of years. For those from Canberra, you'll remember uh, both I was at the Property Council, but more recently you would appreciate that we were Maju Wines, which you'd probably uh, enjoy better than, uh, than my lobbying in property. Um, but uh, I... Uh, you know, this is a wonderful land that we live on here and uh, I know that we've had two acknowledgement of country, so I think what I'll reflect on is that um, traditional owners have created sustainable systems that supported their culture for 65,000 years. Eel and fish traps found around our country, for example, are feats of engineering and among the oldest surviving human-made uh, human infrastructure in the world. Um, and so there is much that we can learn from the past and as we look into the future. It's really wonderful to be here, and especially for a couple of reasons. One, um, Melinda and I are really great mates. Uh, we met through Chief Executive Women, and, and the reason Di and I were late is we were at the Chief Executive Women's Dinner last night, which I'll come back to. And um, Melinda, and with Karen Mundine here, who's from Reconciliation Australia, uh, I was very fortunate to be invited to the Women's Camp of Gama for the last three years. So I, um, I welcome my Yappa sisters, and um, uh, we normally don't dress like this when we're on country. Um, and funnily enough, I bumped into one of my Gama colleagues the other day and she goes, oh my God, you're dressed. Um, it didn't come out the way it should have um, because we're much more relaxed when we're up there. But I do want to acknowledge Melinda and um, Karen. And I also want to acknowledge Di Smith-Gander. Di Smith-Gander is a force of nature. Uh, when I became uh, a member of Chief Executive Women, I just quietly did nothing. Uh, and then Di Smith-Gander called me out on that. Uh, and we're at an AGM and she goes, like, what are you doing, Rom? I said, I'm, I'm at the AGM. No, no, but you're not doing anything. Like, you're not on a committee, you're not being proactive, you're not using your voice. And suffice to say, I now chair two committees. I'm on the board of CEW uh, and I, I think I'm quite proactive. Uh, but it really was, when you're a member of CEW, it can be a little bit scary uh, to start with because these women are quite amazing. And Di has had an impact that I've just shared with you with many women around Australia. Uh, and so it was lovely last night she was involved in a video that Chief Executive Women shared about using your voice and, uh, and asked Di about some of the stories she told last night, which were very funny. So it's, it's wonderful and congratulations on your new role, but it's wonderful to have you here. 
So, as since commencing as Chief Executive of Infrastructure Australia in April, I've travelled around the country talking to people about the challenges and opportunities in their communities and how infrastructure can address these. And as been mentioned, uh, as many of you would know, Infrastructure Australia was established in 2008, but our remit changed in 2014. And what was really important about that is social infrastructure was added to our remit. So to start with, we just looked at transport, telecommunications, energy, uh, and then with social infrastructure, we, we captured the whole uh, remit of that. And we have two main core functions, and it's really important that you understand that because when I speak at these events, people go, we want money for this. And I'm like, we're not the ones with the money, uh, which is why I need to explain who we are. And uh, please don't reflect that I'm the nation building authority. <laughs> but I do, every time I watch it on Wednesday night, go, yep, that happened last week. Um, so the first th major thing we do is we evaluate business cases of, of national significance and that they're, they're seeking, that are seeking investment of over $100 million from the federal government. That then feeds into what is crucially important, specifically with the RBA governor talking about infrastructure investment at the moment, is that we manage what's known as the IPL, the Infrastructure Priority List, and it's known as the pipeline. And so we look at business cases, but we also look at initiatives. So if you hear me talking about the IPL or the pipeline, it's the same document. It currently has 130 projects on it, but given the focus on infrastructure at the moment, and we update it uh, regularly, and the comment that you made, Jim, about collaboration, I may have been collaborating too well because we have now have a 40% increase of projects wanting to go onto the list uh, through our engagement with the jurisdictions. Uh, the second thing we do is set the infrastructure reform agenda uh, to improve living standards and economic and national productivity around Australia. Infrastructure Australia takes a forward-looking view at challenges and opportunities shaping our nation. And we do th this through the National Infrastructure Audit that Jim's mentioned, uh, and the most recent we released in August. Today I'd like to explore some, because it's 642 pages, some of the, um, of the 2019 audit to look beyond the, the work that is, under, done, that is underway in cities. Instead, I'm going to do a deep dive into the issues affecting the 3.3 million Australians who don't live in urban areas. The, the 2019 audit um, was, the first one we did was in 2015, and as I said, we've just released one in 2019. It's an evidence base to guide infrastructure investment and reform and the audit is a result of 12 months worth of work with 150 contributors and we also undertook a survey of 5,500 people to understand how they were grappling with these challenges. Together with our industry and government consultation, we helped identify 180 challenges and opportunities uh, facing Australia's infrastructure. Importantly, the audit is not solely Infrastructure Australia's view, but a common benchmark from which to drive long-term investment and reform. It is also comes at a critical time for infrastructure planning and decision making. A changing climate, looming resource constraints, a shifting geopolitical landscape, evolving global institutions are reordering economies around the world. Closer to home, our population is growing. The structure of our economy is transitioning and rapid technological and demographic change are fundamentally reshaping our day-to-day -day lives. All these factors have significant influence and implications for how we plan, build and deliver our infrastructure. Much of the current infrastructure debate in Australia is focused on our fast-growing cities and they are Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne and Perth. That is understandable as our growing and urbanisation population is a decisive trend influencing Australia's infrastructure in the coming years. More than 60% of Australia's population is in those four fast-growing cities. Of this, 40% is specifically in Sydney and Melbourne. With these cities on track to each have more than 6 million residents by 2031. The pace of growth and change in our fast-growing cities has put many legacy networks under strain. Rising road congestion, crowding on public uh, transport, growing demands of social infrastructure, including health, education and open space, are all key challenges for Australia's governments. However, looking beyond our fast-growing cities, we must also improve the access, quality and cost of infrastructure services for all Australians. In fact, the audit finds that accessibility, quality and cost of infrastructure services varies depending on where people live. 
60% of Australians, as I've said, live in our fast-growing cities, and another 29% in smaller cities and regional centres. But more than 3.3 million Australians, or 12%, live outside of these urban centres. In fact, one in 10 Australians live in small towns with a population of fewer than 10,000. All Australians share a common need for high quality infrastructure that is both accessible and affordable. But beyond these high level outcomes, infrastructure must meet local needs. We know better functioning cities and towns could boost GDP by 29 billion over the long term. Overall, the audit found that infrastructure quality is high in our urban centres, including our small cities and regional centres. Almost all Australians have safe, reliable drinking water and wastewater services to their homes. They are connected to electricity grids that meet 99.99% 99 .99 of forecast customer demand. There is near nationwide access to broadband internet and one of the most extensive, extensive transport networks of the country. Many Australians have access to education, health and other social services that compare favourably with international benchmarks. But location has defined levels in Australia since early European settlement. The tyranny of distance has always made infrastructure delivery more challenging in regional and remote areas. The right infrastructure can unlock growth. But delivery in some parts of Australia is hindered by low population, extreme weather, changing markets and high building costs. Infrastructure is more expensive to provide per unit of consumption in low population density areas. But communities and businesses in these areas are also more reliant on infrastructure for their productivity and wellbeing. Despite this, service provision in some areas remains below what is accessible, ac accessible and acceptable for a high de highly developed nation that prides itself for a fair go for all. Connectivity, both physical and digital, is perhaps the most critical issue for remote communities and people in rural areas. Access, quality and cost of transport and telecommunication links can influence whether a new business gets off the ground or investment is made in a small town. Regional and remote communities are often restricted by inadequate and reliable transport networks. Many roads and railways are susceptible to flooding and deterioration. Large distances are limited and limited access to heavy vehicles on some routes drive up the cost of transport and erode supply chain efficiencies. For example, a report by the Joint Select Committee on Northern Australia found that industries and communities in Northern Australia are heavily reliant on the road network and few alternative net road, uh, routes are accessible in times of disruption. In the Northern Territory, they have just five major sealed roads outside of Darwin. The Great Northern Highway is the only sealed road linking the Northern Territory with centres in Western Australia. And in Northern Queensland, which has a more extensive highway system, it's more reliant on access that, uh, sorry, is reliant on access roads that are not highway grade or frequently or are frequently flooded. For those of you who like mangoes and avocado, that has an impact because they lose 10% of their produce when they, their trucks travel across these roads. Rail networks and port connectivity in Northern Australia are underdeveloped. The Kimberley region does not have rail, a railway lines at all, for example. And these examples underscore the physical barrier that prevents people from building competitive businesses. At the same time, Australia's mobile footprint only covers one third of its land mass. Poor mobile reception and unreliable broadband limit our capacity to communicate, innovate and embrace data-reliant technologies. We know digital inclusion of, is lowest among the communities that needs it most. Take the remote Aboriginal community of Ali Karung, located 300 kilometres north of Alice Springs. Interestingly, this community has a host of budding hip hop stars and YouTube sensations who are using the internet to showcase their talents around the world. In fact, the most recent Australian Digital Inclusion Index has found that this community uses the internet more than the national average to shop online, access news and government services and to connect and communicate. However, the community's digital access is much lower than the Australian average because mobile connectivity is unreliable. 
Very few people have fixed broadband connections, and the higher absolute cost of a gigabyte of data and smaller data allowances on mobile network compared with fixed broadband means that affordability is very poor. This story illustrates why addressing the imbalances in infrastructure service provision must be a priority, because we know this imbalance is reinforcing disadvantage. The infrastructure uh, story of Ali Karang is not, un is not unique. I've been privileged to attend GAMA, which I've mentioned, as a guest of the Yolnu people for the last three years. And this has opened my eyes to the role infrastructure can play in unlocking opportunities for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I've seen firsthand how the challenges faced in regional communities are amplified in Northern Australia. Nowhere is our landscape of droughts and flooding rains more evident than in Northern Australia, which faces the greatest exposure to extreme weather and climate impacts. Remoteness, lack of scale, underinvestment in central services has driven up the cost of business. Risks and barriers to investment in some regions place many first movers at a disadvantage. A lack of coordination across jurisdictional boundaries has resulted in disconnected transport and energy networks and inefficient supply chains. Workforces ebb and flow, depending on projects, with higher mobility rates creating skills shortages in transient communities. Large variations in the quality of life and entrenched, entrenched inequality have also slowed development and investment in many parts of Northern Australia. For example, when I was at Gama, I heard a, a story about Tiwi Island where the mobile coverage had been down for four days. So when you think about access, quality and cost, that meant they couldn't access uh, education, shopping uh, and a whole lot of other services that was required on their community. These challenges are born out, of, uh, out in the slow rate of population growth in northern regions. 2017-18, the Northern Territory was the only state and territory to experience negative growth. But there are largely untapped opportunities in plain sight an abundance of natural resources, large tracts of underdeveloped land, proximity to the booming Asian markets, unique natural beauty and sites of great significance to the world's oldest continuing culture. Infrastructure can play an essential role as a catalyst for growth in northern industries, from agriculture to aerospace, resources to renewable energy. Boosting our physical and digital connectivity can help to open new parts of the country and new opportunities for millions of Australians. The Dampier Peninsula, north of Broome in Western Australia, Australia's Kimberley region, is home to around 2,000 people across four main Aboriginal communities. Around 50 small settlements and seasonal camps are also found in this picture-perfect paradise. But a 205 kilometre stretch of notoriously rough and dusty road isolates these communities and prevents them from seizing economic and employment opportunities. This is why the $65 million upgrade of the boom, a broom to Cape Levesque Road, funded by state and Commonwealth governments, is so important. As the main transport link through the Dampier Peninsula, this infrastructure will be a significant catalyst to unlock the region's economic potential, from pastoralism, aquaculture, resources tourism, and especially First Australians business. This project also underscores the multiplier effect of infrastructure investment as one of the first projects to implement Western Australia's Aboriginal procurement policy. The project has employed 35 Aboriginal people, 30 of them being local. But the road also brings potential negative environmental, cultural and social impacts as tourist numbers are expected to increase by 40% once the road is finally sealed in 2021. Work is now underway to engage with local communities to understand these impacts and the improvements to local infrastructure that's needed. But it is clear we must consider infrastructure investments both strategically and holistically to maximise these benefits. While governments have committed considerable funding to reinforce the critical infrastructure of rural and remote Australia, the audit highlights that these investments have not always delivered the hoped for outcomes. The Australian Government has invested more than $20 billion on regional programs, and this does not include the National Broadband Network or inland, inland Rail. The Productivity Commission has noted that ad hoc financial assistance to regions does little to facilitate transition or long-term development. The audit also finds that other programs have delivered mixed results. 
Over a decade, the Western Australian Government's Royalties for Regions program directed more than 6.9 billion of royalties from states mining and onshore petroleum activities into three and a half thousand odd infrastructure and community projects. But as the audit states, an independent review failed to find any significant or consistent economic or social progress in the state's regions. We must also get better at understanding local needs especially when development occurs on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lands or impacts those communities. The diversity of needs among region and regions and communities, the distinct cultures, languages, tradi traditions and values of First Australians, eliminates any possibility of a one-size-fits-all approach to regulation, funding and policy. Place-based thinking does involve upfront time and cost, but this initial outlay typically secures higher success rates and more positive long-term outcomes for the community. So in closing, Infrastructure Australia's role is to ensure accessible, high quality and affordable infrastructure is available for all Australians, regardless of where they live. While a lot of the discussion and debate has focused on the infrastructure investment required to keep our cities moving in the metropolitan century, we must not overlook the 12% of Australians who live outside our urban areas. In releasing the 2019 audit, we're aiming to start a conversation about the infrastructure and investments reforms that will best serve all our communities, including the many Australians that call our satellite cities, regional centres and remote communities home. The 2019 audit is a central contributor to the national conversation about investments and reform that best serves all communities. We are committed to hearing a diversity of views during the consultation process, which is now underway following the audit's release. We're, under, we're in the um, period of a three-month um, consultation, which will inform the development of the 2021 Australian Infrastructure Plan a blueprint for infrastructure reform that will underpin our ongoing policy and research work, which Jim has mentioned. I welcome your insights and feedback on the audit with a, we, while we develop a clear and positive infrastructure agenda for all Australians. Thank you very much. Thanks, Romilly. Um, well, if everyone's not energised, uh, I'm not sure what will get you energised. Fantastic. Um, talk. Thank you, Romilly. Um, just some observations uh, from me to sort of kick off the conversation. What are, what are my takeaways? Um, connected, connectedness, if that's a word. Um, clearly, we've got a leader here who really um, relates to all of Australia, not just Sydney and Melbourne, and not just a, a big freeway in, in either one of those two cities. Really refreshing to hear that, Romilly. Thank you for that. Um, the other couple of observations I'll make is that um, the role of technology, I think, um, is going to be obviously become increasingly important. Uh, the, the, the money that we've got available to spend on infrastructure is is uh, is not limitless. So I think um, our ability as a society to think of smarter ways of using the existing infrastructure and make it uh, increase its capacity by uh, virtue of technology, I think, is going to be critical to our to our future. So on those sort of opening remarks, I'll open it to the floor. While you're thinking of um, questions, I just want to pick up some points that you've made um, around collaboration. I spoke at the Infrastructure Pro Partnerships um, um, conference yesterday and I was asked, you know, what my um, aim for Infrastructure Australia was and the, the word that I used was collaboration. Uh, it's really important that you understand that that we're quite unique in Australia with our governance in infrastructure. So we have eye bodies now in every state in Australia. So Infrastructure Australia is an eye body, but then every state has an eye body. And now we work incredibly closely with the territories, uh, that being ACT and Northern Territory. And we get together regularly and we're now um, developing a program of work because what was happening is we we're all focusing on things um, at IWA. And I know there's a number of people here from Western Australia here is the latest eye body. We're all doing pieces of work together Together, and then it was kind of like, well, why don't we just do it together instead of individually? So we are doing that. And the success of the pipeline is that we work very closely with the states and territories, um, irrespective of who's in government, to identify what the potential is when it comes to infrastructure. So I think the word collaboration is really important. I couldn't agree more. Uh, questions, please. We, we, ha we have one here, I think. Um, so, n name and, and organisation, please. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Michael Hartman from Skills Impact. Um, I'm glad to hear that you've got social infrastructure as, as part of your remit. Um, 
one of the things that has developed in Australia is, you know, governments have tried to create a, a training market in, in an area that quite often there isn't a proper marketplace. Uh, as a lowly funded sort of area, the vocational education and training has now sort of drifted into a high volume, low margin business, which means it's heading towards all the capital cities, leaving regional and remote Australia with very little access to training resources. Is that something that's on your agenda? Um, so I want to cover off two areas there. I'll start the first one, which is skills. The audit um, looks at education and the importance of um, the, 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 not just the tertiary education system but the TAFE system. Picking up a point Jim made about telecommunications and um, technology, we identify that that there is this opportunity through technology now that we can make it available for all Australians. But they have to have mobile coverage and they have to have the ability to be able to download and, and use that. So that's one of the challenges. So there's 180 challenges and opportunities identified in the audit. I suggest uh, if you want to um, navigate the audit, download the executive summary, which is 85 pages, uh, and that helps then navigate the 642 document page document because there is two addendums on it. Um, but coming back, we do identify that A is an opportunity around education, um, B, but it, we need the technology to allow them to have access. So that comes back to access, quality and cost that I was talking about. They don't have that. I want to pick up another point on skills. We have a whole chapter on industry efficiency, capacity and capability. And I think you talked about this yesterday, about this infrastructure boom that we're in. We don't talk about it as a boom. We talk about it as the new normal. But one of the things that has been identified is that there are inherent skill shortages around Australia when it comes to this infrastructure, which is why we're really reliant on the TAFE system. So a great example in um, Transport for New South Wales had a project that they were doing and they knew that there was this skill shortage in some of the areas to do with the construction. They worked very closely with the local TAFE uh, and um, in, in lining up with the TAFE to, uh, to bring people in and then work directly onto the project. And I think that type of partnership and collaboration you'll see more and more as we get these mega projects, which is a project over a billion dollars, we're getting more of these mega projects in Australia and we, we are identifying um, these skill shortages. Thanks, Rami. Another great example of, of the training um, that you spoke about is happening in Melbourne where um, there's a, a, a mining or tunnelling school being developed um, to facilitate all the, the tunnelling work that's going on in Melbourne. So, yeah, there's examples like that popping up all over all the country, which is great to see. Next question. I actually, while you think of that, New South Wales is sending their, they're working really closely with Victoria and they're sending their um, staff to the, Vic, the Victorian Training Centre. Hi, it's uh, Damien Graham from First State Super. Um, we, uh, we have a look at lots of different projects as well, not, not as many as you, I'm sure, but uh, try to get a sense of what, how we should invest money for our members on a longer term basis. And the way that climate change is impacting those sort of investment cases is, is um, I find very challenging. Uh, and trying to understand how we should scenario test for that on a very long term basis is, is again, very, very challenging to do. So I was hoping to get some insights or thoughts on how you, you're thinking about it from an Infrastructure Australia perspective as to, uh, to really test the, the prioritisation that you get to do? So the first thing we do is I talk to you about the business cases that we do, which is projects over 100 million. Two years ago, we have to um, review our assessment framework methodology every two years. Two years ago, we included impacts of climate change in that assessment framework. So when uh, jurisdictions are putting their business cases into us now, they're not just looking with an economic lens as part of the cost benefit analysis, they have to pick up um, climate change as well. But it's an area that requires more work and sophistication. So to come back to uh, two things, firstly in the audit, we call out the importance of sustainability and resilience and we say that it's both a challenge, but it's a huge opportunity for Australia. But we think that there's a lot of opportunity in Australia that we can do better. Secondly, Climate Works is actually looking at this right now and is working very closely with Infrastructure Sustainability Council of Australia and ASBEC. Um, Megan Motto is here um, from Governance Institute, but she and I sat on ASBEC, which is the Australian Sustainable Built Environment Council. Um, and uh, so Climate Works is looking exactly at that. 
The reason being is they did, ClimateWorks did the work in property around what was the property, uh, property's impact on climate change and what was the uh, future opportunities and um, the issues around that. And so they're using, and it was called low carbon, high performance. And it really did a great, uh, it really identified what the challenges were, but what the opportunities were. They're now using that same methodology on infrastructure. So it's, it's very early days, um, but I'm happy to talk to you um, after this. But the, the audit very much picks up the issue especially around resilience in our cities. Um, as you know, Rockefeller um, is doing some work through Sydney and Melbourne um, capital cities with, like, resilient Sydney, for instance. Um, but I, I think this is... I keep using the term opportunity because I, I, I... From my 17 years in real estate, I think real estate is much more mature in this area of climate change understanding of the impacts and I think infrastructure has um, some ways to go. So I'm getting um, a flashing signal on this saying we're running short of time, but there's time for one more question. Is, is there anyone else? There's one at the very back I can see. We can't see you, so you'll have to... It really is like what, a rock concert Wave like here. a Collingwood... <laughs> Does that make me? It's a rock concert out here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's Darren, Darren Disney from BP. <laughs> That's a first to me. Uh, Darren Disney from BP in the back row. <laughs> um, just a question on the telecommunication gap in yeah. regional, in remote communities. Does IA see that more as a um, mobile network, mobile black spot solution, or more of an NBN solution? And and how do you see that gap being bridged? So what I need to be clear about is it's an audit. So the aim of the audit is to identify what the challenges are and, and to identify what I've said to you about the mobile black spots. And we also have uh, talk about uh, um, some areas that we think uh, about... We talk about the NBN in the audit. We don't... It's not the solutions. That's the plan, which is the next document. So we don't identify what we think should happen. All we're doing is we're calling it out, which is the role of Infrastructure Australia, is to make sure we call out all these challenges. Um, so there's a lot in there under the tele communications chapter um, around um, the issues of what should be done. But one of the things we, we do say is that there are opportunities to think about it differently um, in the types of telecommunications um, and, and technology that can be used in some of these communities. So I'll give you one example. There was an earthquake recently in Northern Territory. There was an Indigenous community that had no access to telecommunications. So they felt the earth moving, but they didn't know what was going on. So there are, there are solutions that need to be considered. Um, I'm not a telecommunications expert, so I'm not going to try and answer that because I don't think I'll do it justice. What I, when I said to you that we've got a, a consultation period out there, we're looking for you, if you have that experience, to tell us what you think the solutions should be, whether that's a broadband solution, a satellite solution, an NBN solution, whatever you think that solution should be, that's what we're looking from to, to put into the plan. And the reason the plan is so important is the federal government has to respond to it. It's part of what's in our act. And so we, we give the plan to the government. And so that's why we're really looking forward to your input to put into there. Thanks, Romley. We, we really have run out of time. But um, once again, thank you for a really energetic talk. And please join me in, in thanking Romley. Thanks. Thanks, Jim.